Um, live captioning is available throughout the presentation. This session will employ breakout sessions. Um, please mute your mics during the presentation if um, I don't catch you first. And uh, we're gonna pause at the end for any Q&A. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jenny and Stella, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you. I am going to share my screen. Not the right screen, yes. <laughs> Bella, where are you? Okay, there you are. Um, well, I'm not gonna read the title again because we already did. So I'm just going to get to the next. Um, so our agenda for today is we're going to um, give a few introductions. We're going to talk about the background of um, you know, what using AI, uh, no, actually the background is who we, who we were as an institution. And I say were because Stella has since moved on to a different institution, but we sort of are going to be speaking about our experience um, when Stella was at Wheaton College in Mass before she moved to American University in DC. We'll give a little back, bit of background about um, what Wheaton is like and, um, we're gonna go over some ethical, just a quick overview and like thinking a little bit deeply about the ethical considerations of using AI as a tool, which I'm sure many of us are thinking about these ethical considerations. Um, and then the practical uses of AI, what tools did we use, how we used them and how they made our work as a three person team a lot easier. Um, and then because I, neither of us wanted to talk for a full 50 minutes <laughs> and because it's always, um, you know, better to have some participation, we're going to have breakout rooms with small group discussions in which you are going to have the opportunity, either in your group or alone, to use um, some of these tools or at least explore them and think about how you might use them in your own instruction. And then finally, um, we'll have some Q&A. So, okay, who we are, Stella, you're up. <laughs> okay, so I am Stella Hudson. Um, as previously said, I am the humanities and social sciences librarian at um, American University. Um, and as Jenny alluded to, I have just started that job um, on May 20th. And previously before that for about a year, um, I was the social sciences and assessment librarian um, at Wheaton College in Massachusetts, and that is where I worked very closely with Jenny and these AI tools. And also you worked very closely with, um, I'm going to give a shout out to Carrie, who was in this uh, session, I think, and she was one of our, one of the three in our, our um, research and instruction department. And um, so you're there, but I'm not going to say your last name. <laughs> um, but anyways, okay, so I'm Jenny Castell. It said in the in Naomi slide, I'm research and instruction librarian, but that's the name of the department. And I always, I've been at Wheaton since September, and I always get my um, title wrong. I'm actually the instruction and technology librarian, but I also do research and instruction at Wheaton College. Um, and when I started, um, Stella was also fairly new to Wheaton. So we were sort of like three, well, Carrie was there for a long time. And then there were two sort of like new to Wheaton librarians. Um, so it was a really, I think we were a great, a great team. Also, I just want to give um, who we are. We were talking before everybody sh showed up. Stella and I would do a great podcast. So if you are looking to have a very like formal um, presentation that you wanted to watch, this is probably, this may not be it. We're chatty and I had a lot of coffee today. So I apologize uh, for not sticking to the script, um, but this is, this is it. Anything else, Stella, or is it really time to move on? I've sort of mm -hmm. overdone this slide. Got it. Okay, so the next, I'm actually going to um, 
do we have a poll we wanted everybody to do um, you could go to pollev.com and then it will ask you to add the person's name and the their number so you'll add like jenny castell 180 or you can scan this qr code um, i'm not looking at the chat so if for some reason i've gotten this wrong and it's not working naomi if you could please um, I, I used the QR code and it worked for me on my phone. Okay. So, yeah, I went so ahead the and put the, put the link in the chat too. So you can also just click awesome. on Thank that. you, Stella. So our, our poll, this first question is, what is your experience using AI in the classroom or for planning? And so far we have somebody said, okay, we have a lot of people saying, okay, two people. <laughs> Okay, so so no experience. That's interesting. Okay. Um, am I still sharing? I'm still sharing my screen. Good. Um, I just love watching these come in. Okay, so a lot of people haven't used it. Some people have used it for for planning. Oh, talked about AI literacy in class. That's interesting. I'd be interesting, interested to hear like how, how you did that AI literacy materials and run a, an AI activity for grad students. I'm actually really surprised. Um, maybe, I guess I'm surprised that people aren't using it to, to help them with planning, just dabbling. Tried it in the classroom a couple of times. Okay, so I'm, that's also intriguing. I'd be interested to know like, did you try it in the classroom with students or did you try it to plan the classroom experience? For ideation, yeah, it can definitely be helpful for in for brainstorming, brainstorming pre-assignment. Okay. AI literacy basics of LLM and AI ethics. Yeah, a draft of something that I can work with, definitely, yeah. Definitely good for brainstorming and for, for sort of like drafting. We're going to be talking about that too, like how, how we used it is similar to, to that. Okay, so this is, so I'm seeing that we had a lot of no uses, no use or no experience and a lot of people sort of using it for brainstorming and for like a structure, drafting, lesson planning, definitely. This is how we used it. Just looking at the time because I we could sit here and watch them all come in. If you haven't um, answered yet, I'm just I'm I am going to move on to the next question. Um, I think this should be the same R, same QR code, but it might not be. <laughs> I didn't I didn't practice, so um, I think you have to. But it is the same. Hmm. Those responses are coming in. Anybody use try this one yet? It's the same QR code. When you push the button, it pushed my question to the next. Perfect. So, okay, yeah. thank you. We should have practiced, but life is busy. Um, so this question is: How does your institution view AI as a teaching tool? And I, this is to me like an interesting question because a lot of the conversation and in at least our my institution is student use of AI, but I'm not hearing a lot about AI as a teaching tool, you know, as a supporting pedagogy. Um, excited to support faculty, largely largely left up to faculty. We don't have a formal policy. Some faculty, some ban it. Yeah, can use in some circumstances, and this is interesting. I wonder if that one is in the teaching circumstances are for students instructor yeah a lot of like varied policies provides advice and help yeah Bella what where are you do you know at AU like what they're if they're talking about it in terms of teaching um no so policy on right now purpose. the library is is actively working at AU on um, like writing formal AI policies um, yeah. 
and setting up a committee for um, doing some like background research into how they want to incorporate like AI literacy into the yeah um, like information literacy instruction yeah yeah like in the previous question um I, this one is interesting no policy on purpose so I'm assuming that's because they want faculty to determine its use. Um, still exploring best use cases for teaching and student use. Um, we have an AI policy. Oh, instructional design uses it for some components of course development. Yeah, so that definitely goes along with sort of how we have been using it. A lot of pushback from humanities. Business department more excited about embracing AI with students and faculty. That makes sense, I think. Um, this is so interesting to see all of these responses. There really is such a wide range. Institution leaves it up to faculty to determine policy, but stresses that faculty need to be clear with students about what they can and can't do. Policy should be in the syllabus, yeah. A lot of fear reworking the academic code of conduct. Yeah, there's definitely fear. These are such great responses. Thank you, everybody. We have one more question. I'm going to do this. We're, we're already running out of time. So <laughs> I'm going to just jump, still exploring. Um, so the next question is, what are you hoping to get out of this session? Ideas. Okay, great. We are going to introduce, there might be one tool that we introduced that you have not heard of. So um, hopefully that can, how to use AI in instruction, use cases for AI and what conversations, ethical considerations you've had in the planning process. Yeah, we're going to cover that a little bit. ways to talk about and incorporate AI into the instruction itself. Yeah, so we, we're more covering in this session, like the planning of instruction, but I'm also interested <laughs> in how people are using um, it actually in the classroom with students. AI for information literacy and library instruction, yeah. How AI can be an effective tool in teaching information literacy I'm in learning mode. I'm trying to get as many different AI workshops as I can get. That's awesome. And I can, as I can to get a better feel for how the library can use AI in our instruction and how to work with faculty. Yeah, that's a good one. I wish we could answer and speak to every single one of these, <laughs> but, um, how to teach without encouraging cheating. Oof, that's a good one too. I see you nodding, Stella. Yeah, I feel like part of it, and maybe I shouldn't be having this, we shouldn't be having this conversation right now during our presentation, but this is where the podcast part comes in. Um, I feel like it's it's like a cultural, or it has to be like a, shift in how we frame the use of AI from AI equals cheating to AI as sort of a tool like any other tool. Um, you go from the card catalog to the online catalog, right? It's just like it is different and there are different ethical implications, but um, from cooking over an open fire to cooking with an oven, you know, so it's that sort of just like shift learning about how, okay. So these are all great. Thank you. Um, so Stella also, please just tell me to stop talking if I need to stop talking. <laughs> um, thank you everybody for answering the question, the questions in this um, poll. These, this has been like really helpful for us to see, you know, what you're thinking about, what you're experiencing. 
in your own institutions. Um, oops, that's not what I want to do. I want to do the slideshow. And now I pass it on to Stella. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you again, everyone, for answering those questions. That was really interesting um, for us to be able to see. Um, going over our just brief learning objectives for this um, presentation, um, we're first, we're going to try to explain the potential benefits of using AI to generate information literacy lesson plans. Um, we also want to articulate ethical considerations and potential limitations associated with using AI for lesson planning. Um, and thirdly, we want to formulate strategies for incorporating specific AI tools to streamline lesson creation and collaboration, personalize learning, and integrate new technologies into your own planning processes. All right, so we wanted to start out with these ethical considerations um, because these are really important to be considering when deciding um, when and how and even if to use um, a new tool. So some questions that we commonly get are things like, is AI evil? Um, is using it cheating? Um, and does it make your lessons or your teaching worse? Um, you'll also see we have a little picture of uh, an evil robot guy here, um, and we did uh, use um, Adobe Firefly to try to generate a, an AI um, person, an evil AI figure, um, and in the process of creating that image, um, we found a couple, um, you know, things that kind of highlight our, our main points. Um, when using the term like handsome to describe a person, we were always getting male presenting images. Um, and when we would use attractive, um, it would be more female presenting. Um, a lot of the images, almost all of them had very white or Eurocentric features um, when we were describing them as attractive or handsome or beautiful. Um, and finally, when we were using the word hot, uh, the AI was interpreting it as meaning like uh, on fire. So it just goes to show you that the the specifics of the words that you use in your prompts are going to make a big difference and that the AI is going to be um, interpreting your words maybe differently than how you mean them, um, which is why it's, it's really inherently biased. Like you just always have to be aware of this in inherent bias. Yeah. Okay, you can go on to the next. Yeah. Um, okay, so generative AI does have some major problems. Um, one of those is considering data security, um, especially with academic librarians. Um, your systems and potentially you personally have access to student sensitive data, including medical data or financial data. Um, so you do need to be aware of the tools that you're using and what their terms of services are. This is not one of the times where it's, um, you know, good to just see the giant block of text and hit agree, no matter what. Um, reading those or doing some research and being aware of that is really important. Um, and the other thing that is really important is that AI has inherent bias. Um, so people tend to think of machines or AI or computers as inherently more logical um, or objective than a person might be, but in reality, um, they're only as good as what they've been trained on, and they are trained on materials made by people, um, and therefore they have the same um, biases, they're shaped by the same systems as those people, so things like racism, sexism, um, particular um, worldviews, all of those things might be overrepresented or underrepresented in the sets that they are being trained on, and that will impact how the AI interprets your prompts and the things that it can generate. Um, so it's important to be aware of those things while you're using it. Um, okay, is using AI cheating? This is not in the specific case of a, a student using AI to do their work for them, but in the case of a professional person using AI as a tool to complete their work. Um, so I would say when you're a professional using AI as a tool, that it should not feel like you're cheating or doing something wrong. Um, I know that that can be a big issue, especially for um, people in libraries that they feel like they should be doing things a certain way or be perfect all the time and that straying from that um, is, is a kind of like cheating. Um, 
but librarianship is about serving users and doing that as effectively as possible. Um, we're only human and this job can be very stressful, especially now. Um, so I think that using every tool that is available to us, as long as we are doing it responsibly and thoughtfully, um, is totally fine and should even be encouraged um, because it helps us be better and do more. Um, okay, so the other thing that is talked about a lot in AI, especially with um, instruction, is that it kind of interrupts that very important teacher-student connection. Um, and that would be the case if you, you know, put into AI, write a lesson plan for, you know, information literacy, and then you just read off whatever it spits out to you in the classroom. Um, that probably would not be a, a good or effective lesson plan. But if you're using it as a tool, um, it should make things easier for you and better for you, not worse. Um, so you always need to remember to rely on your own expertise and knowledge um, and use AI as a tool, not a replacement. Um, if you don't like something the AI says, or you disagree with something the AI says, or you wanna change what the AI says, you should do it. Um, don't think of it as a higher authority than yourself. Um, and then we're also very aware that human connection is essential within the classroom. Um, and rather than AI creating a barrier between you and your students, you should let it lift a little bit of your burden in some areas, leaving yes. you with more time and energy to focus on connecting with students and doing the parts of your job that you find the most fulfilling. Um, I love that one. <laughs> okay, so... Um, keeping those ethical considerations in mind, um, this is kind of just a brief overview of our experience using ChatGPT. <laughs> um, so when I worked at Wheaton, it was a, a three-person team. We had it kind of split up into humanities, yeah. and success, social Sorry, skills, and assessment, um, and then science and technology. Um, and that was me, Jenny, and Carrie. Um, so our our roles were all of our subject-specific uh, instruction, and then one third of all freshman seminar sessions, which was a required session for first year Wheaton students to take. Um, we had research consultations, we had chat hours, um, we were in charge of collection development, and then we also all had our, our secondary roles, um, student success assessment or technology. So we were kind of juggling uh, a lot of things. Um, and as Jenny said at the beginning, um, both she and I started um, around the same time, um, and we were both very new. Um, Jenny had been a librarian for a while, but it was my first job out of grad school. Um, so we were kind of had some challenges, some unique challenges, but also an interesting opportunity to kind of figure out how we wanted to work together as a team and kind of start fresh. Um, and make sure that it was is working for all of us. Um, so we used AI mostly to help with collaboration, uh, standard lesson planning, and co-teaching. So um, we had a basic freshman seminar lesson plan that we could each modify to suit our own styles and class needs. Um, and in modifying those, depending on what the professors asked for specifically or the size of the classes, um, we could use AI to help with that. Um, one thing I used was the, the lesson plan was designed for a maximum of 36 students. Um, and I had a section that was going to be uh, over 50 students. And I was able to just put in the activity numbers um, and have the AI do the math for me to expand everything and say, oh, this is how many of each thing that you're going to need um, to cover, you know, 50 plus students rather than 36 instead of me having to do all of that calculation and math by myself. Um, it also really helped with collaborative workshops. Um, we had things like orientation, um, citing sources workshops, writing annotated bibliography workshops using Domain of One's Own, which is a, is a website platform that, that Wheaton uses. Um, and then we also had a lot of interdisciplinary classes. Um, so things like teaching math for education majors. Um, the professor asked if, you know, Jenny and I could both teach that together. 
Um, and so using AI to kind of help with that collaboration was something that we started to do. Okay, unmute, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> we're actually sort of running out of time. So I'm gonna like rush through this slide a little um, really quickly, but so just like going more generally, like how a great way to sort of use um, these like AI tools to make your work more effective and take the load off is like, as I noticed some of you answered in the poll, um, is, you know, using um, chat GPT or Google Gemini, which I, I can't show you because I'm on a work computer and it's blocked. So that might be also sort of like something to think about is like what sites is your institution blocking, but um, is definitely as Stella said, we used it a lot to write lessons, to write the activities. And also, I don't know about you, but I'm terrible at workshop titles, presentation titles, um, email subject headings. Um, AI has been very helpful in um, sort of like helping to brainstorm um, titles, the structure of a lesson. Um, and sort of those like repeating aspects, uh, you know, what do I say to move from one activity or one concept to the next? It can like really help to take the, the weight of having that on your shoulders. It doesn't mean you're not creative or, or intelligent or thoughtful. Um, it's again, as we keep reiterating, it's another tool to use. Um, as long as you, like we tell our students, are using your critical thinking skills to go through and, um, you know, revise. So I put this, um, so these are the tools. So we definitely really use chat GPT a lot. I took this screenshot, but actually what I'm going to do is open up chat GPT. Um, so you will have to make a free account, um, chatgpt.com. And then you have, you enter your prompt. So, um, and one thing that I really like about it is that it keeps a library of all the times that you've used it. And so you can go in, copy them, and then um, reuse them or see what you've done. So this was, I thought this was interesting. So I was teaching a class on how to use Qualtrics to, it was, was it, I don't remember if it was a social sciences class or a design class, but my prompt was create a lesson plan for college students to learn about survey design, best practices, how to use Qualtrics, primarily employing active learning and group activities. So I don't know if we said this, but what you enter into the prompt is what you're going to get. So, you know, just like when you're searching in a database, you want to be sort of as specific, but also a little bit, you know, general as well. Um, you know, and this is what this is what ChatGPT came up with. You know, these activities. Was it too much time? Yes. So what I did was I added in, I edited it, and I added in a different prompt. And then what it came up with was a little bit different. Um, and then I did it again a third time. This time I, I realized, oh, our sessions are only 80 minutes. So I actually have to tell chat GPT, I only want an 80 minute session. Um, it actually turned out pretty well. Um, so this is, this is what chat GPT looks like. You add in a prompt, and you tell it what you want, a lesson plan. Um, the next one that I'm going to show you and the last one, like I said, I can't show you Google Gemini. I used to use it when it was Google Bard. And I don't know how it's changed, Stella. I don't know if you used Google Gemini recently. Um, Stella, so in our library, we often have like workshops for each other during our department meetings. And one of our workshops was like, AI tools and Stella introduced us to Magic School AI, which is amazing. It's used in a lot of K through 12, but you can also use it, um, you have a choice to use it for higher ed. And um, I 
used it in this, uh, let me go back here. In this example to create a rubric because Lord knows creating rubrics, rubrics are like the worst. It's the, I'm sorry, I think it is the worst thing ever. So it has you generate, it has a rubric generator. I don't know if you can see this. Um, like when I chose rubric, I was able to choose university, I put in the objectives for the lesson plan, I put in the assignment description, and then this it, you know, obviously I I would go in and change it, but it was like it felt very nice to have this rubric um right there and created. So again, you will for most of these tools, you have to create a free account. But these are all of the sort of like options. Um worksheet generator. There, I just saw one that said academic grant. Where was that? Oh, academic content, student work feedback, um, unit plan generator, you know, rubric. So this is what I, having AI write a rubric for an assignment. Um, so you have, oh, there it is actually. So you have all of your different tools. You know, it's really, it, write an email. I have used it to write an email. Um, you know, it can be really, I have to have major imposter syndrome. And when I'm writing an email to like an administrator or somebody like way above me, it can be really helpful to have, um, you know, AI generate a very formal, academic, smart sounding email. And then I can go in and I'm still doing the work because I'm telling, I'm putting in the prompt everything that I want to say, but it's doing the writing for me. Um, so I think I covered everything. I'm sorry, now this is all like messed up. I'm gonna go back to the slideshow. I'm gonna look at how much time we have, which is absolutely nothing. Um, so the pro tips, similar to a keyword search in a database, um, use it for aspects like material list, introductions, which can be super hard, timing, how much time should I do on this activity? We pretty much should have done that for this presentation. So. <laughs> um, the outline, you know, it is an iterative, oops, sorry. It is an iterative process. So you may have to add in a prompt and edit that prompt multiple times until you get what you want. You're treating AI as a collaborator. So you are relying on your own expertise still. Um, Again, always consider bias inherent in, in the AI tool. You know, again, use that, those critical thinking skills. Um, okay, whew. so our breakout room activity. We are going to break out. Um, there are going to be uh, groups of four and you are going to create a prompt for a lesson or really for, for whatever you want to do. You can work in your group or you can all be like, hey, we're going to work. Um, I want to work alone, even though I'm in a breakout room. Um, I'm going to, I put a, our Google Doc into the chat. That is the link to the activity. We're going to use, you can use chat, chat GPT. You can use Google Gemini or Magic AI. Uh, you could try any of these three. You can use all three or just one of them. And then there are some answers. There are some questions. Um, those questions are in up here, but they're also in the Google Doc. Okay, it looks like many of you are in, some of you are in the Google Doc. Is anybody having a hard time? Oh, we both put the doc in there, Stella. Great minds think alike. Um, is anybody having a hard time accessing the Google Doc? Or does anybody have any questions about what you're supposed to do? So like group one will be breakout room one, group two will be breakout group two. And then you can like answer, you can be like, we use chat, GPT, and this is the answer to question one or whatever. This is the answer to question two. So um, I think Stella and I are going to try to prop, uh, pop in to those breakout rooms. Um, looks like there, there are four. Naomi, I don't know if we need to make more. 
Um, I have it open. Do you want me to open them? And yeah. Why don't you? Okay. Why don't you open do them that. and do? Thank you so much. <laughs> and you can feel free to write it all in this shared Google Doc. And this is something that we'll share at the end, so that you have this as like a record of what you did during this presentation. Maybe you'll. You can add links here if you generated something really cool. You will, if you don't already have an account for ChatGPT or Magic AI, you will have to create one. It should be fairly quick. And we have um, and let's fling you out into your groups. Good luck. And you can always ask questions and come back the main room. It might take a minute. We'll miss you guest who said they have to step away. It looks like you need to click the, the more button um, and you'll see then at the bottom it says breakout rooms and there you can join. Um, oh, okay. You have breakout to, room you want. So you have to choose to Sunday join. People. Yeah. Oh, it's not like the good old days of instruction okay Launching them into the <laughs> just join a random room yeah just join whatever room okay thank you. Oh, okay it doesn't assign great thank you i had no idea and now we know <laughs> or like if you see a room there and nobody else is there or there's just one person join so nobody's alone So if people's names are like gray, does that mean they've been moved? They're in a room. I don't know, man. I don't know either. <laughs> oh, and you can broadcast all the rooms, so that's good. It looks like almost everybody. Helen, maybe in like two minutes we can join the rooms. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. There are some rooms that don't. Oh, there's just one person in the. Room eight has only one person. So if you're still moving to a room, feel free to move, go in there with that one person. Also room one has only one person. Okay, room one now has two people. Thank you. Yay, room eight now has two people. Okay. <laughs> okay, room 10 has two people. Yay. Actually, we only have nine minutes, so. Okay, good.
I would love to close these rooms that have zero, but it, I don't have the delete button anymore. <laughs> Looks like most people figured it out. You're muted, girl. <laughs> um, we only have like eight minutes, so maybe we'll just leave them and they can. Um... Do their thing. Does everybody see the countdown? There's like a count. Oh, 854. Okay, great. I see it. I don't okay. know if they will see it. I don't. We see can it. give, there's a broadcast. So I'm going to broadcast. Wait, there's something called broadcast voice. Oh, yeah. So you can talk. Broadcast voice. I thought it was like <laughs> use the AI broadcast voice. <laughs> I type an answer into this Q and A. Well, we did lose some people in the move to the breakout rooms, but that's okay. You have about, you have about six and a half minutes. Was that using the broadcast voice? <laughs> Did it work? Do you? Do you, did they hear it? I'm not sure, but yes. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm not in the room. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I was muted. I was, I'm thinking we were a little bit optimistic about how much could be done in these breakout rooms in such a short amount of time, but um, 
you know, maybe it'll give people a little bit of an opportunity to just think about it or. I'm looking at the timing and I'm wondering if we should pull anybody, if we should pull them in earlier, just because it's. Um, I feel like we should just give them another 60 seconds, if that's OK. Yeah, let me see if I can warn them. We went a little bit too long with the poll, and that's my fault. I apologize. <laughs> it's okay. It was just really it's exciting exciting. to see all the different answers, you know, and. I know people are actually answering. Yeah. And, and like, you know, there are so many policies about students um, regarding student use, but like, what about faculty use or staff use? You know, something sort of like different to think about. Stella, you're so good at <laughs> presenting. Thanks. Oh, shoot, this is being recorded. Oh, well. <laughs> okay, so everybody's coming. Well, so we'll just let everybody come back in. We'll see how many people we lost between <laughs> leaving the breakout rooms and All right, we might as well just jump into our discussion. Thank you. Um everybody for participating. I know it wasn't, there wasn't that much time. Like this would have been a great half an hour activity where we could like join you in the rooms. And, um, you know, I don't even know if making the, the, your um, accounts took the entire time, but I know with students, it always takes a really long time to, if you want them to make an account with, for something in your class session. But Welcome back. Um, and we did, Stella, I don't remember if this is your part or my part. It's my part. Okay, go on, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so hopefully you had a little bit of time to either talk or think or play around in your breakout room sessions. Um, this is gonna be time for just sort of a more relaxed Q&A for all of you. Um, some things to sort of get you started or thinking are some questions. What did you notice or learn when you were in your small group sessions? Um, what experiences or ideas would you like to share either from your um, small group sessions or from your, your career? Um, and then also any questions that you have um, for Jenny and I um, that we could help. Um, and so for this, you can either, you know, raise your hand or just unmute yourself and go for it, or you can put um, any questions you have in the chat and we'll try to get to them that way as well. <laughs> 